taken by that. Okay, so to go back in a second in the chronology of last year, the other thing I want to address is this. At the end of the year, I mean, if you remember, obviously the split ended where they just put the whole rookie team in when they realized that, like, you know, the old veterans weren't going to make it and you weren't going to make playoffs anyway, so screw it. You know, like, the idea was give these other players time and then, you know, we'll see, do we want them next year? Do we want some of them next year? Let's see, right? And so this is one area that I think there's a lot of confusion about. When the off-season came... Now, obviously, they didn't retain any of the players from the first line. Like, they all did go. In fact, most of them even went before the end of the split. But a lot of people thought, and I'd heard these rumours, well, they are, for example, keeping leader. Like, leader's staying as a mid laner. I think maybe one or one of them. I know Dan Dan obviously stayed. Like, they were keeping a couple of players, right? And so the story I heard went like this in the off-season last year. It was like they basically sort of told you, like, yeah, we're probably going to sign you, or you, maybe you even had a contract or something at the time. And it wasn't until basically right at the end of the off-season that you just found out one day, like, oh, yeah, you're, you're not going to be on the team next year. Because obviously, like, if people saw, they came back with Febivern and they went a different route, right? Now, in if what people might not know if they're fans is, like, the time we're recording this is actually the first day when people can sign players for this off-season, right? And what you'll see is in these first few days, most of the deals will all be done because people have already behind the scenes had the conversations and they kind of know where they want to go and who they want and they have their shortlist. And so, actually, even though it's called this off-season... It's like the game, I don't know if you know this game, if you have it in Norway, it's called musical chairs that you play when you're a little kid. There's all these chairs laid out in the music. Yeah, and you, the idea is there's not enough chairs for everyone. And so when the music stops, you have to run over and get your chair, otherwise you're out of the game. Yeah. So that's kind of what the off season's like. Like all the spots go really quickly. And famously, this actually happened to Otto Amne a few years ago. There was once a time where there was a rumor that he was going to join G2. And so a load of really good teams in LEC and LCS just didn't even bother approaching him because they thought, well, he's already gone. And it turned out they'd already signed players players when he came and said oh that was just a rumor like they'd already signed worse players actually and they even said well I would have signed you but it wasn't available so am I accurate here that you basically kind of like when you were finally available to go to a different team almost everyone was gone at least all the LEC spots were gone right yeah I don't really remember when they told me like exactly that I was not going to play but I do remember for a fact that I was promised that I was going to play I even triple checked to be sure if I was going to be the starting mid laner for next year. And then they said, there's no way that they see me not starting. That's what I got told word by word. And um, I didn't know. This was basically my first off season. So I didn't know like how off season really works. Right. But after experiencing this off season, I've understood that right after Worlds or even right after LEC, people that are allowed to explore options, uh, uh, the orcs will contact them already. Like the the orcs uh, that that are at the worlds, even we, if they're not in worlds, they will start already contacting them and trying to make deals with them. And if they've heard uh, from other source, sources that uh, this player won't be ab uh, available, this guy has a really crazy buyout, especially for rookies. And I was a rookie, and I think I had my uh, not bad of a buyout. Like it was it's, it's shocked still when I heard what my buyout was. But in the end. Like I said, the rumors and the feedback that the, the other orcs were getting was a large impact on that. But uh, so uh, I don't really know. But uh, I had one more year of contract uh, on the team. Like it was even a talk about extending my contract like a, a month back uh, with the team once again. So it just came as a shock for me. That's for sure. So and I would say it was it was late for LEC. It was late for ERLs as well. Because one thing that this leads to is when you then went back to the ERLs, you ended up going to mouse spots and making this team, which to be fair, had some players people will know, like obviously the bot laner people who've been in the LEC as well, Jessica and these other players. So in this scenario, right, one of the things I noticed you alluded to at the end of the twit longer that you put out where you announced in this off season that you basically hadn't got an LEC spot. I asked you about this just before we began is even though you joined a team with some good players, etc., you kind of just joined last minute, even in that scenario, right? It wasn't like a team that like you sat down or any, no one really planned this team out, right? You just joined it, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, so basically what happened was like, uh, I didn't know what to do because uh, it seems like uh, I didn't really get many offers from other ERLs as well. That's the most shocking part for me. Like I didn't really get much contact, but then again, it's understand and understandable because they probably signed their mid laner and already had plans for them. And they, it's good that they went with them. I don't want them to get backstabbed. Like uh, basically the way I did, so it would be really hypocritical for of me to join them then. And but 
I joined uh, Opsis. I, I'm a really good friend of Opsis, and I did enjoy playing with him as well with the time that uh, I've been. And I think I improved quite a lot on, on when I played LEC and with the teammates I already had. And uh, we basically just got a team that everyone seemed good and like av average at best, let's say average at best. And then we got the bot lane that I had honestly no clue how they would be, but I know that I played against Jeskla and he, he seemed good. And I don't know about Promise Q because he was a sub for G2 and he didn't really play much competitive. So it was still a question mark for me, but this team, it was probably the most fun I've had in a team. Personally, even though it didn't succeed the way we wanted to, we didn't even win a single year Masters, and uh, it, it was just sad, you know. But uh, but for a team that was basically on the fly, uh, I, I am still happy, and the or organization as well. Like I'm really grateful to, uh, to Mouse for picking me up on the whim. As you say, and that that was another issue I think happened this year with your story in terms of the Reddit narratives. In the same way as you got your hype in Season 9 from winning EU Masters, this year, because people... This is what's interesting about the way that the story always seems to work in LEC. The same fans and orgs that love the idea of rookies and trying out new talent, they also are addicted to that exact concept because once they think they've already tried someone out, it's like they throw them away and it's like, it's like getting a scratch ticket of lottery. It's like, right, I need another one. Like, let's check the one did I win oh, I didn't win right another one it's like they don't want to actually go back to the same person so unless you basically come in LEC and immediately stomp everyone like I, I mean not many players have ever done it but I guess like perks or maybe you could say like humanoid did it a little bit you know like or caps like unless you come in and you're actually unbelievably good people will just think like oh, I didn't make it you know it's so whatever let's try the next guy so one of the things I actually do think affected it is you probably had to try and win an EU Masters split again like that. You kind of need to get your name out there again and make people pay attention again. Like, do you think the fact that your team didn't, I mean, there's still the decent results. You had top eight at the first one, you had semis at the other one. Like, do you feel as though not winning was like a, was an issue in terms of making people take notice of leader again? That's what I thought at the beginning, that me not even being able to win EU Masters these two years was the issues for me of not getting picked up. But it seemed like, the main issue was all these rumors that was going around me that kind of impacted for the most teams. And and uh, honestly, people just thinking that uh, I'm used up goods, basically, right? Like, uh, I'll, I'll just use the term. Yeah. I'm used up goods. Like, people already know what, I, what I'm capable of and uh, everything. It, it, people are already are, like looking at me as I'm a veteran as well for some reason when I haven't... Uh, I played less competitive than most people in the in the LEC or, or wherever, even the even in the ERLs. Uh, but but yeah, uh, I basically got the confirmation. It's not because you didn't win EU Masters. It's because there's so many question marks around you and so much risk.